I own it will give you a front row seat to the positioning, bold moves, and sometimes the doggy dog negotiations that go on behind the scenes of the deals that break the norms, set the precedent, and become the case study we devour as we harness our craft. Welcome to the season. Leverage. You got it or you don't. Welcome to I Own It. It's good to be here. So Jeff, what is leverage to you? <laughs> well, leverage is really success, isn't it, in the end? And it's about using other resources to get you where you want. So it's really, and if you sum it up, other people's money. And that's usually what you're trying to do. Now, ultimately, it could just be a little bit of power. It could be a little bit of influence. It could be a lot of different things that come together. But ultimately, you're driving towards a goal. And leverage makes you do something that's very difficult a lot easier. When was the first time you learned about leverage? I've been doing it all my life. Probably the first time I did it was when I had little kids working with me when I was about 10 years old mowing grass, you know, mowing lawns. Mm -hmm. And I used to get other kids to go and do it, and I'd go out and sell the jobs and then have them come in and help me get them completed. So that was my first uh, time that I ever learned about leverage. And when you learned about leverage, what side of the equation were you on? Well, I want to be the guy that's controlling the lever right? Mm -hmm. Not the guy that's having to pick up the ball at the end, right? I want to be the person that's pushing the buttons. When you're pushing the buttons, what does that look like for the other side? Well, hopefully it's, it's a mutual win. If you don't have a mutual win, why would you want to do it? Mm -hmm. there, then you lose your leverage, right? So you want to make it a win-win for everybody that's involved. So leverage should be about mutual conditions of satisfaction where you both win. If power and influence equals leverage, you need to be honest with yourself. Ask yourself, what side are you on? What do you want? Where do you have power? And also, where do you have influence? And remember, you always have power and influence. It's always there. What you learn from Jeffrey is that we're creating multiple conditions of satisfaction. This is what creates a win-win. When you were at Eastman Kodak, how did you use your skills and your knowledge to leverage into becoming a guest on The Apprentice. Well, that was a, a really interesting story. I was sitting with my team looking to launch a brand new product that we had. It was a very iconic product, an inkjet printer that was going up against what I called Big Ink at the time. Well, I'm not allowed to say their name, but their initials are HP, all right? Mm -hmm. So we were going up against this company, which I called Big Ink. And we needed a way in which to position our model differently than their, their model, which basically is pricey ink sucks. And we all know what that's like. The inkjet, uh, inkjet uh, cartridges are locked up behind the counter. It's almost like they give you the printer for free and then charge you for the inkjet cartridges. That's really about it. It's like a pipe, like a crack pipe almost in, 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 in a very similar kind of uh, mode. So what we wanted to do was find something that we could do that would then be somewhat iconic in the way that we could market it. We were sitting around the table in my conference room at the headquarters of Kodak, and I said, why don't we put it on The Apprentice show? And everybody said, that's great, but we don't know Donald Trump. I said, well, call him. And they said, we didn't know how to call him. So I picked up the phone, and I called Donald Trump. Couldn't get through to him, but I left a very good message, and 10 minutes later, he called me back, and then we worked out how we could do that show, and then put me in touch with Mark Burnett, and then the, the rest was history. I was on that show for three more years with Kodak, and we used that that forum and that platform to leverage our sales and marketing efforts, which resulted in billions of dollars. After you were on The Apprentice and then you go back out into the business world, what did you learn and what did you use leverage for to really catapult your career? That's a great question. It, certainly a show at that time, like Apprentice, was the number one show. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the same as Big Bang Theory, all right? 13 million people would tune in to watch that show in a given night. That's a lot of people in today's TV numbers. Mm -hmm. And so there was an instant credibility of being on the show uh, as a judge and being seen as someone who was judging the celebrities, whatever they might have been at the time. You know, that was seen as a really positive thing. That led me to other TV deals with other networks and being a commentator on most of the bigger networks and then eventually led me to my own show on Bloomberg. 
And uh, you can imagine from there as well, that led to consulting contracts, boards, and a lot of other things to build the personal brand of myself. Because if I'm selling myself, I'm selling the company. If I'm selling the company, I'm selling myself. So the leverage of that was very, very positive. Think about what you're doing right now. Think about what you're investing in. And ask yourself, where's it going? Where's it leading you? Everything you think you do and every tool you use is leading somewhere. If you don't intentionally drive it, then you're just guessing. And guessing isn't winning. How do you, generally speaking, implement leverage into your daily routine in your life? It's another great question. I think the most important thing for most people, especially people who are starting out in new business or looking to do something a little bit different, is start with the end in mind. What is the outcome that you want to have? And then work your way backwards to make it as easy as possible to get to that point. A lot of people don't always start with that. So my son, who's their chief marketing officer and probably one of the best chief marketing officers I've ever known in my life, always says, what problem are we solving? And that's really when you think about leverage and you think about moving things and moving large blocks and everything, you're beginning with the end in mind. Where do I want that block to be? And then I'll move it based on that and I'll put the leverage points and the touch points there beforehand. And that's usually the way I do it. I, I tend to think a little bit more strategic with that end in mind and then figure out what's the easiest way to get there because I'm a little lazy too. Wasn't well, that the key to business is to understand the other side's issue or challenges or problems and then be that solution-oriented party that will solve their challenges. Absolutely. It's, it's always about the value, and that's how you extract value. And if you don't know what those are, then you're probably on the other side of the equation. Podcasts are all over the place now. We know that, right? <laughs> exactly. How do you use your podcast to, that, to differentiate it from other podcasts? There's thousands out there. What do you do differently? There's actually millions and millions of podcasts. There's going to be millions. We're, if you look at podcast industry today, we're really, truly, if we looked at it like in a, a person, we're still in the teenage phase of podcasts. So we're in the rebellious stage. There's a lot more that's going to happen in that. The way I use my podcast and the way I tell other people who are in it, the B2B market, and that's primarily what we serve. I'm talking to business leaders. And the way that I want to do that is I typically want to have people on my show that I want to do business with or be associated with so people see that's the kind of person that I might be doing business with. And so now I use mine to attract other people into our network. So I'm typically using a lot more celebrities, billion dollar brands, people are making a difference in the marketplace, or my last criteria is people I really like. So there's something that they're doing. Like the guy that's making flour from crickets, Probably not the, you know, the biggest money maker, but I just think it's really cool that he's doing it, right? At the same time, I might have somebody controversial like Piers Morgan, and we'll talk about gun control or some other issue, or Gene Simmons, who I got fired on Celebrity Apprentice. Now, but typically what I'll tell most people who are doing business-to-business -business podcast is to either use the show in order to dominate the category that you're in so that you become the thought leader. Because if you're not the thought leader in your category, who cares? There's a million other podcasts just like yours. So the difference is how to differentiate yourself from everybody else, maybe to leverage yourself against everybody else. And then if you're really like a consultant, a trainer, an author, a speaker, or something like that, and you're trying to be a thought leader, invest in, in getting to the people you want to do business with. Listen, who's the expert in your industry? Don't, don't say it's you. We know it's not. Ask yourself, who are they? What are they doing? And how are they adding value? Listen, we have to get real. How are you going to be different? How will I know it's you? See, this is where the work comes in. This is where you stop hoping and stop guessing. So go out there and own it. If you do 50 shows in a given week, or excuse me, 50 shows in a given year, and you could close 10, 20% of that, that's five, 10 new clients that you'll have at the end of the year. Now, some people say, Jeff, I'd like to increase that better. Well, are you going to sell more? Typically not, because right. you, you sell the way you sell. Well, what's the answer? Do more podcasts. And so you increase your frequency, increase your frequency, increase your close rate, and you'll have more business. And that's really a great way to be able to do it. And by the way, let me say, everybody has to become an expert these days. Content's the name of the game. Content drives community, community drives commerce. So if you're a dry cleaner in St. Louis, there's 119 other dry cleaners in St. Louis. 
you have to become the doctor of spots. You have to be seen as the person who's the expert, and you have to give that content out there so people will see you and find you, discover you, so you leverage what you do. You leverage your IP, your IP that's up here and your IP that's right here in order to have other people come and do business with you. That's the name of the game today. So are you suggesting that everyone, no matter what, should have a brand, a Absolutely. personal brand? Without question. We all have one. Right. And brand is nothing but a promise delivered. So whether you're a mom, you're delivering a promise. Whether you're a kid, you're delivering a promise. And if you're a business executive, you're delivering a promise. You have a brand. So what's that brand going to be and how are you going to represent it? Now, a lot of people like to think about brand as, you know, the attributes that we think of. Having been a chief marketing officer at Kodak, you know, people would say, oh, the iconic brand of Kodak and it's yellow and, go and red and all this. No, 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 no. We were always about make, manage, and move images and information. We were about the Kodak moment. That's the essence of the brand, delivering that one iconic moment that made you feel good, made you cry. So for each of us in our own brands as individuals, we have our own brands because of the promises that we deliver. You know, I'm known as a kind of a boardroom cowboy because that's what I do all the time. I'm a little bit of a re rebel, but I'm also delivering deals all the time, bought and sold over 250 companies, 25 billion in operations. That's my brand. All right? It's not what I wear, okay? It's not the boots that I have on right now or the pen that I have in my pocket. Those are just attributes of the brand. Got it. So with leverage, when is taking leverage too far for you? Well, for me, if it's not a win-win scenario, what do I want to do it for? Mm -hmm. There have been times when I've had power or win over someone else at their detriment. That doesn't make me feel good. So it's really about your own personal conditions of satisfaction. And those, I think, are real, real good for you to develop. Now, for me, I want to build wealth, right? I grew up a poor kid uh, all over the country. My father was in the military. So I want to have a better living than I had when I grew up. And I want my children and their children, my grandchildren, who I dearly love, to have a better start than I did. They're going to have that. The second thing I want to do is I want to learn new things. And the third thing is I want to have fun, you know? And I want to do it in the right way. And I think that's important for us. And it's cost me money sometimes to do things in the right way. So l taking leverage too far is not something I try to do intentional. So are you looking at more of, I want a long-term relationship. This party might come back into my universe and, and we're going to ha have to go at it again? Well, I've learned being a C-suite 100 officer in a, you know, in, a, in, a, in a Fortune 100 company and to being in the C-suite where there's only 500 in the world, it does come back to you. That's it right. will always come back to you. And so you will see this person again. And you'll see the bad players again, and you'll see the good players. I'd much rather see the good players, and I'd much rather surround myself with those good players, having a great time, maybe drinking a little scotch, and doing some great business. Jeff, thanks for being on I Own It. My Appreciate pleasure. It. Thank you, brother. It's time to jump out of your comfort zone and start using leverage you have right in front of you. Are you ready to put in the hard work? If you said yes, then what are you waiting for? Let's go out there and own it together.